Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Stephanie Hendrickson, Executive Editor for Additive Manufacturing Media, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation brought to you by Velo3D. In this webinar, we're going to be looking at the use of metal 3D printing for optimizing tooling components like high pressure die cast inserts. We're going to hear how Velo 3D Sapphire printers have been able to overcome design limitations related to cooling channels and other features for more capable and longer lasting tools. So I want to introduce our speakers. Um, we have with us today Paul Halawadi. He is the Director of Sales for the Midwest for Velo 3D. Um, Paul has experience in many types of metal and polymer 3D printing, as well as conventional manufacturing, including CNC machining and injection molding. For the last two decades, he has helped businesses identify and solve challenges with new manufacturing solutions. Our second speaker is Siddharthan Sel Selva Siddhar, <laughs> sorry, um, Selva, S Selva Sacker, uh, Applications Development Engineer. Uh, Sid has a background in automotive and chemical engineering with more than seven years experience in additive. He has a track record of engineering AM solutions and has filed 28 patents in the AM space. So just a couple of housekeeping things about today's presentation. Um, first off, I want to let you know you can submit questions for Paul and Sid at any time during the presentation. Um, there's a questions panel to, should be on the right hand side of your screen and we'll save time to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, secondly, this webinar is being recorded and you will get a link to the recording afterwards if you want to reference it later, or if you want to share it with somebody that will be available. Um, and before I turn things over to our speakers, we're actually going to kick things off with a couple of poll questions. Um, so the first one that we have, uh, what types of applications are you most interested in? Um, so options are high pressure die cast inserts, um, injection molding dies, extrusion dies, or hot stamping dies, um, all of the above or other, which you can let us know in the chat. And I, I apologize, I started out of order. This is actually the second one, but we'll go back to the first. <laughs> All right, so responses are coming in. Um, it looks like a lot of people are here for injection molding dyes. Um, and actually all of the above is, is the leading response right now. So um, lots of interest in, in all these different types of, of tooling applications. All right. Um, and then our second question, what describes your reason for joining today's webinar? So A, we're exploring bringing additive manufacturing technology in-house. B, we're looking for additional information on Velo's fully integrated additive manufacturing solution. C, help with a specific part or application or D, other. Uh, so we'll just give folks a, a few minutes here to respond. All right, uh, looking to bring additive manufacturing in-house is, is leading, but it's followed very closely by people looking for additional information on, on Velo's additive solution. Um, not a lot signed on today with a specific part or application. So we'll leave those open for a little while. Um, again, if you do have specific questions that you'd like to ask throughout the presentation, the Q&A panel will be, will be open. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers. So uh, Sid, I think you're starting us off. Take it away. Great. Many thanks, Stephanie. Um, all right, maybe just to set the stage, why don't we kind of get into a little bit of background behind tooling. Um, all tooling is, it refers to a mold uh, or a die, which is just, the negative cavity space where molten material gets shot into uh, to produce the positive part. Um, and tooling, it's used across a variety of different verticals across many industries, uh, from biomedical, aerospace, automotive. Um, and it's uh, the predominant way to produce parts at really large volumes for manufacturing. Um, some basic components that we see in um, 
for example, high pressure die casting or certain injection molding applications for components in the tooling system could be cavity and core halves, which are the halves that are either static or moving in the tooling system. Uh, cooling channels where fluids are run inside of the tool to make sure uh, the tool is cool sufficiently before a new fresh batch of molten material gets shot in, uh, which we call a cycle. And uh, these cooling channels uh, is what reduce the overall, overall cycle time uh, of the tool. We also have uh, a series of runners and gates, uh, which allow for molten material to flow in to the positive or the, the cavity and, uh, and uh, uh, fill up uh, the actual mold or the dye itself. And injection components, which uh, allow the positive part to pop off the dye or the mold uh, once it's been sufficiently cooled. Um, so this is pretty much involved with a variety of different manufacturing modalities from injection molding, high pressure die casting, uh, and blow molding, for example, stamping to a certain extent too. Um, and a lot of what we see in the automotive world uh, is a lot of utility around HPDC, um, short term for high pressure die casting, injection molding, and, and this and hot stamping. Um, and the materials that we've, uh, we've seen predominantly being used as tool steel has been applied to metal AM for, for quite some time, for, for years. And the Velo 3D technology does provide unique advantages and ability to create difficult and complex geometries that we could, couldn't all otherwise print with uh, conventional AM that allows us to really improve the utility we can get uh, with these printed tooling parts. Um, and the material that uh, we're, we're introducing is emerging steel, uh, which is pervasive and pretty common in the tooling industry. And within automotive itself, right, we're, we're seeing this growing use, particularly for electric vehicles. Um, we're seeing these larger tools being uh, needed by these automotive OEMs, these, this need for larger inserts with subsequently larger and more robust uh, cooling channels as well. So kind of diving into some of the benefits and key metrics we want to keep our eye on when it comes to 3D printed tooling. It's throughput and manufacturing efficiency. Really how we can design the tool or the cooling system within the tool to reduce our cycle time. Um, and this will in turn reduce your overall piece price or part cost for the positive part that pops out of the tool. Um, and we can get that with uh, a tooling insert that's very well engineered for advanced cooling. Um, in addition, with printed tooling, we have the ability to de-risk complex and intricate features that might be um, on the working surface of our mold or die. And uh, instead of cut a, cutting a production tool, which could be expensive, 3D printing the, the feature itself uh, could be a, a very cost-effective way of, of addressing some of that. And what I've also noticed is, um, in my experience, is the sourcing time reduction and getting a tool printed or a tooling insert printed versus getting one cut, right? This, you could be shaving off several weeks in your production cycle by doing that. Uh, which is a significant uh, uh, time saver. Um, but another hidden um, improvement we can get with printer tooling is your part property enhancements. So because you can rapidly cool your parts and you can control uh, the thermal profile of the tool itself, uh, you can achieve different material properties um, in, your, uh, in your part uh, in your printed or in your in the positive part that comes out of the tool. Uh, not only that, you have a better handle of how distortion or deformation um, is going to be like with the, uh, with the with the positive part as well. So you do have some really nice enhancements and improvements, not only on mechanical properties, but your dimensionality of your part, and you have a lot more fine tuned control over that uh, with your printed tooling solution. So 
target opportunity that we see primarily is uh, around both injection molding and high pressure die casting. Uh, we see a lot of this benefit with these uh, larger cooling channels uh, that uh, are required with these larger inserts. Um, and particularly with high pressure die casting where you're gonna have really extreme temperatures and extreme working conditions of your tool, uh, enabling a better thermal control of your process is uh, gonna be uh, highly beneficial to improving the overall utility and the effectiveness uh, of your tool itself. So kind of scaling things, things back to what we've seen with conventional AM, um, some common problems could be uh, the ability to create circular cooling channels uh, that are larger than maybe six millimeters in diameter. Uh, an associated problem we see with that is the, uh, the degradation of the downskin of the top surface of those cooling channels. It's typically uh, a bit tough to enable that stitch line that we've seen um, with, with uh, conventional AM. And that degradation uh, does contribute to a portion of build failures. Uh, this could be due to recorder crashes, for example, as uh, the top of those closures tend to warp up if it's not uh, being printed correctly. Um, and also there is uh, another, another issue with these, uh, with these rough downskins is that it can contribute to reduced fatigue life uh, of your tool. Um, a rough area at that downskin can be lo uh, locations for crack initiation. Um, so this could lead to premature tool failure, uh, which uh, we'd want to avoid. And as a result, uh, a lot of AM users have uh, sort of defaulted to designing these uh, printed tooling inserts with smaller co cooling channels that are maybe five millimeters or less. Um, but this has the trade-off that you're not able to uh, pull as much heat away from the tool. As a result, you don't get uh, that much, uh, that effective of a heat transfer as a result. Another issue that we've, uh, we, we've seen in the industry with conventional AM is the distortion uh, associated uh, during the printing process. Um, and these large inserts, they can uh, dis distort proportionally uh, quite a bit more as well, right? And this can affect the overall dimensionality of your printed tool, right? You, you wanna make sure that whatever your tooling insert uh, uh, comes off the machine, it's, uh, it meets the critical dimensions of the part itself. Otherwise, the part that's going to come off the tool is uh, not going to be within spec, right? Um, so it's distortion is a, is a very common challenge uh, that we've seen uh, in con when it, with regards to printing out tooling inserts that include uh, a working surface. Um, so in terms of current material options that we've seen, it's typically marriaging steel in the uh, laser powder bit fusion uh, uh, side of things. Um, and it's used quite prevalently in the, uh, the, the, the dye and tooling industry. So why Velo3D? Um, Velo3D has uh, technology and a process which, is, which lends quite well to producing parts for really good fluid flow and uh, overall heat transfer. So we have the benefit of being able to produce cooling channels that are um, that can go up to 100 millimeters in diameter with relatively good surface finish, really good quality uh, uh, roughness. And we do not get that much uh, downskin degradation as well at the top surface of those cooling channels, which is very critical to the overall performance of the printed tool. Um, and the way we uh, release materials for production, we do have catered recipes uh, for each, uh, for each uh, material that we wanna be running on our machines. So we do have a catered recipe for the M300 material, uh, which enables us to print with, with uh, minimal distortion uh, as well. Uh, so with that, maybe that's a natural segue to uh, you know, Paul's topic giving us a little bit of background into uh, Velo3D's end-to-end -end solution. Great, thank you, uh, 
Sid. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, give an introduction of Velo 3D and why, and, and give a detailed description of what we're doing and why Velo is different. Um, a little background on the company. Uh, Benny Buller, who's pictured here, is our CEO and founder. He, he founded the company in 2014. Um, and the reason he did is he was a physicist working for a venture capital company. Uh, he was doing due diligence on companies that they would invest in. And he spoke to some uh, space engineers who told them, told him they had some great designs, but they just didn't have a method of manufacturing. Them. So he set out to create essentially a service bureau, bought a standard metal 3D printer, the standard third-party software, thought if he could just tweak the hardware, tweak the parameters, he could produce these impossible parts. He quickly realized that that wasn't going to be possible, and he, he scrapped that idea and then started with a blank slate. The machine you see behind him here is the Velo 3D Sapphire. So he started with that first machine, created his own slicer, which is called Flow, and that's where we take in native CAD files software recognizes the different features of the geometry and applies recipes automatically. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about the hardware, but so our, our, our real goal is to produce uh, high, uh, highly complex metal parts without compromising the designer quality. Um, and and that's, that's always been our goal. Um, and we're, we've got a team of 10 engineers that are constantly looking out for those opportunities to convert to metal AM. And they're also providing, uh, free consulting. Um, we went public last year. Um, and, uh, we, we now have sales and support worldwide. Uh, we do design and build all of our equipment in, in the United States, in California. Um, so it, here's an example of some of our customers. Uh, we started in the space industry. SpaceX was our first customer, very large customer for us. Um, aviation and defense are, as well as energy, are also big industries for additive manufacturing as well as Velo. Um, we, I, I'm based in the Detroit area. I, I cover the Midwest and um, was looking out for new opportunities in Metal AM. And we began working with some automotive companies and their, their initial need was in tooling. Um, Metal AM hasn't been as readily accepted in the automotive industry because the volumes have always been so high. Um, but we found we found a couple really good applications, and we're very excited going forward. Um, here's here's an example of some parts, and what we we always focus on is parts that are optimized to con control the flow of fluids or the transfer of heat. And why do we do that? Because it's difficult to do, and we're we're able to produce these these cooling channels. Um, heat exchangers, uh, here's some examples of some die cast tooling inserts, shrouded impellers. Uh, again, we do a lot of work in the space industry, uh, propellant tanks, thrusters, um, oil and gas. Um, so it was a natural, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was natural for us to get into the high pressure die cast tooling um, or the automotive industry doing high pressure die cast tooling because that's what we've always done. Um, if you're not familiar with laser powder bit fusion, we're basically moving powder across all metal laser powder bed fusion is moving powder across the plate. And then we're coming in with a laser and lasing that material. Um, our process is a little different. And uh, I guess it, we don't have, we can't show the video here, but what we're basically doing is we've got a non-contact recoder where we come across the plate, we lay down a thick layer of material, 
normalize it with a normalizing plate, and we vacuum up the remaining powder, which then goes into a sieve and goes into a hopper and refeeds the recoder. So that eliminates what is a very big problem with laser powder bed fusion is recoder crashes. Um, so why are supports needed? Uh, supports are really, supports are uh, supports in, in polymer additive manufacturing. In metal additive manufacturing, supports are used to really anchor the part down. As I mean, we're basically welding every 50 micron layers. And as, as the material melts and cools, it, it wants to lift up. Um, with, with our fully integrated solution, we've been able to eliminate support on internal features. We, we're not completely support free, um, but where the supports, where support free matters, is what we really focus on. Uh, and here's an example. This is one of the first parts we started with, which is a shrouded impeller. So typically with conventional metal AM, if you printed a shrouded impeller flat, you'd have support internal supports that you wouldn't be able to remove. So one, tr one way of tricking the system is to throw it up on an angle. And you probably, I'm, I'm sure everyone in the audience has seen photos of uh, uh, laser powder bed fusion parts that have been put up on an angle. And why do you do that? To eliminate the internal supports. Problem is you're, you're, it's, you're, you've got a longer build time. You're using a lot more material to support the part. But the biggest problem is this part is spinning at 30,000 RPM and you're gonna have a very difficult time balancing that part um, to be effective. We've been able to print this part flat and we're down to, I think, 3% um, three percent degree overhang. Um, so we've eliminated that 45 degree rule. And this this is what this is what really sets us apart. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, it's really an end-to-end -end solution or a fully integrated manu added manufacturing solution. And it's made up of our hardware, which is the Sapphire family of printers, our flow software, which is our slicer or our print preparation software. And on the back end, our Assure quality validation software. So they all work together. When, when we give you a quote for a system, it includes everything. It's one price that includes everything. We don't piecemeal out these uh, different uh, uh, areas. Um, so getting into flow print preparation software, we take in native CAD files. We don't use STLs. And what that allows us to do is the software can recognize different features of the part and apply recipes to it. Now, we also have sub recipes that can be applied by the, uh, by the engineer. Um, but it, it really simplifies the process and um, using native CAD files uh, gives us a, a huge benefit over STLs. Yeah, and, uh, and, and it's those recipes it, it, which is going to be um, one of the, the main advantages that we've seen with um, what we offer compared to conventional AM, because we can specifically build these features, which are otherwise typical to build, difficult to build. Um, yeah. And uh, you can even see in this image right here, right? You can have very thin walls, you can have uh, really sharp overhangs, um, and the recipes that go into this uh, allow us to print these features without uh, any significant negative impacts on our overall part properties. Uh, which is a, a very cool uh, uh, improvement. And we're able to really control all of this through our software uh, and flow. And it really gives us the ability, especially when we're talking about high pressure die cast tooling to do large cooling channels. It, as Sid mentioned, the, with the growing EV market, the need for larger uh, die cast tooling is important and as the, the tools get larger the inserts get larger and the cooling channels 
have to be larger. So we're looking for very circular cooling channels with very smooth upskin and downskin surfaces and to provide a long life on the tool and, and cool the, the, uh, the, the part properly. It's a very high pressure die cast tooling is a very rough environment. Uh, one of my customers gave me a quote. He said, it's, it's easier to put a part in space and bring it back down than to create a high pressure die cast tooling insert. You're going from, 600 degrees C down to 60 degrees C in about a minute. So it's very rough on the tooling. Um, so with the Sapphire family of printers, we've got over 900 sensors on the machine. Um, we, we use multi lasers, uh, lasers on both systems. Uh, the Sapphire, our first machine that we came out with, has a round build plate. So it's 315 millimeters in diameter by 400 millimeters tall. Now we have full use of that build plate. Uh, the build plate slides in and we lock it in from the side. So there's no lockout holes and we're using two one kilowatt lasers. We also have the option of going to one meter in the Z. So it'd be 350 millimeters in diameter by a meter tall. And it's also using two one kilowatt lasers. Uh, the Sapphire XC, we sold our first, or we shipped our first Sapphire XC uh, in December of last year. And uh, that's a very, very large machine, uh, 600 millimeters in diameter, about 550 millimeters tall with eight one kilowatt lasers. So we see a four, four times the throughput on, on the Sapphire XC. Yeah, and this is really a really great uh, uh, benefit, particularly for the justification of printed tooling. Because um, oftentimes what I've seen is that people kind of see the cost of printed tooling and they say, why don't we just cut the tool instead? But with the type of throughput that we can get with these machines that we have, uh, we can really improve the overall economics of, of additive uh, for these tooling inserts. Yeah, and we, 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 we show that to our customers who have part files, and we're happy to look at, 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 at any part files that uh, you'd want to send us. Um, the, 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 these, the XE is great for large parts, but it's also great for a, a lot of small parts, which uh, we we really see the benefit of uh, part cost wise. Um, now the Sapphire XE1MZ, uh, we extend the elevator and we can go up to one meter Z. This is the largest metal AM system in the industry. And there, there's a very large demand for these, these size machines. So uh, our Assure quality validation software now, with a lot of conventional metal AM systems, you, you'll see third-party applications for both your slicer as well as if they choose to uh, go with the validation software. Uh, with Again, with our system, everything is all built in. Um, so what the Assure Quality Validation software does is, number one, give you factory monitoring. And that can be within your factory, that can be across the world and it's real-time fleet tracking. I think one of the, the key benefits though of Assure is the ability to do push button calibration. And that's done by the operator. Um, that can be pre-build, post-build, or a lot of our customers will, will work with a one week uh, cadence for their calibration. Um, so we're, we're checking powder bed quality, laser focus, laser alignment, uh, thermal sensor, beam stability. Um, we do in-process monitoring as well. Um, we'll do uh, laser alignment every single layer. And that's, that's really important as you're building your part, as your chamber heats up. Um, it's important to always verify your, your laser stitching. Otherwise, you'll 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 lose your accuracy and you'll see stitch lines in your part. You'll never see a stitch line in a bellow part. Um, I mentioned a little bit about our 
um, non-contact recoder. So what we do before and after every recoat is we take a photo in a structured light scan. So that shows us the quality of the powder bed as well as where the part is. And we, we track all that information. Um, so we've, we've, we've got a tolerance set up here. If it approaches that tolerance, you'll get a warning. If it exceeds another tolerance, the machine will just automatically stop so it doesn't damage the, uh, the machine. Um, and, and like I said, this, this is what I've found to be one of the biggest contributors to uh, build part failures is the recoder crashing into the part, killing your build and damaging your recoder. Um, so the, again, the, the, the calibration is important because it's done by the operator and it's done on a regular interval, interval, a short interval. Um, it's not done on a quarterly basis like you typically see in the industry. So our machines always remain in calibration and that's very important for um, distributed, uh, for a, a, an effective distributed supply chain. So customers of ours can, can outsource parts, whether it's in Cincinnati, Indianapolis, uh, Houston or, or Oklahoma, and they'll get the same parts. And um, that that's that's really been missing in in this industry. And what? Um, well, let me let me move move on to the uh, how we support our customers. And this is one thing that I really I've been in the industry for quite a while. And what really struck me with Velo is the ability to support every customer. I mean, we, we have weekly meetings with, with our customers. Um, we have a three to one ratio of machines to field service engineers. And it's, it's just a, it's, uh, we, we, we've just got a great team and we're, we're very focused on, on supporting our customer base. Um, and so go, getting back to the, uh, distributed supply chain. So with our flow software, what we, after the part is sliced, we create a Velo print file. And that's a lockdown file. And we refer to it as a golden print file because this is a part file that you can send uh, anywhere in the world and get the same results on a Velo machine. Um, and that could be today, that could be next year, or it could be 10 years from now. But it's an uneditable file, and um, you know it's not it's not just a sales pitch. It's what our customers are doing today. We've got some customers who have decided to go with Velo, and uh, without purchasing machine, just to rely on our contract manufacturing network. And and this is our this is our contract manufacturing network. Uh, what we look for in our contract manufacturers is uh, really companies that that know metal, that are CNC shops first, not service bureaus. Um, and we've got we've got a lot of big names here, and um, our companies that are very focused on running production parts. It's very difficult for a contract manufacturer to make money um, running one-off prototypes, constantly changing out material. Our machines are production machines. They're not meant to be, uh, the material's not meant to be flipped every week. Um, it's potentially possible, but it, it's it's not recommended. Uh, because, of, because of our work in the space and aerospace industry, they, they um, don't allow customers to flip their material uh, on their machines. Um, because there's a risk of contamination. Um, so when, when uh, uh, and we, we keep a very close eye, we've got a, as I mentioned, a team of 10 engineers that works very closely with our contract manufacturers. Um, we've, we've learned some lessons over the years. We don't, we don't sell powder. Um, customers can buy their powder from any powder source. 
Um, we give recommendations on who we use and what materials that uh, we've already um, qual what what material uh, powder manufacturers we've already qualified to run. Uh, and we're open to if you if you've got a new uh, powder supplier that you want to use, we'll we'll run it through our system first and make sure it flows properly and works, and then you're you're good to go. The other thing is we don't print parts. And that's why our contract manufacturing network is so significant. Um, we don't want to be in competition with our own customer base. So um, we've uh, we've got our, our contract manufacturing network across the world, and um, we we have a great relationship with each and every one of them. And um, it's uh, it's 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 a nice situation. Um, so with the ability to have a consistent process really gives us the ability to really simplify the part qualification process. Um, we work with MMPDS as well as NACE, and uh, we, we've got our own studies that will be coming out. Um, and it, it's really based on, on that golden print file and HET running machines that are calibrated. I know that MMPDS, the requirement is to run um, three powder lots at three different locations with three different heat treats. And um, it, it, you, you couldn't do that if your machine wasn't consistent. And we see that all the time today where uh, conventional metal AM, um, they could be out as much as 20% um, from machine to machine even if the machines were purchased at the same time, but they're in different locations, um, same parameters, and, and they're it's, and then that, and that's really what we, what our goal is is to to simplify the whole metal AM process. There's a lot of variables involved with metal AM, and we've really simplified it through our software. Um, so now we'll. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but we'll we'll get into a, a little bit more of the uh, M300 tool steel, which is miraging steel. Um, do you want to take the lead, Sid? Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Yeah, so M300 tool steel, like we mentioned before, it's it's quite a proven material for the die and tooling industry, um, and it's been used for for decades. Um, it's uh, the property sheet that we've got uh, for the recipe of M300 that we produce is available on our website. Um, it is uh, a heat treatable material. Um, so it's uh, after you print the part, you, you can go ahead and post process it to achieve any specific, specific properties that you're looking for, augment certain, um, uh, whether it's, uh, maybe your your ductility or whether it's uh, tensile strength there's uh, there's some room for that as well it um, is it is the, the choice of material for laser powder bed fusion as it's not susceptible to cracking uh, compared to h13 uh, which is typically uh, challenging to print and we have a number of materials on our material roadmap uh, for tool steel M M three hundred is is one of them in, a, in our first tool steel. Um, the I think the the real goal is to with tool steel is to get more H thirteen like materials. H thirteen is not used in laser powder bed fusion because it does crack. Right. And with M three hundred, right, we've we've really demonstrated that. Uh, we can achieve these uh, cooling channels without significant erosion of um, the downskin of the top of those closures or of those channels, even with these larger diameter profiles. Uh, and this is something we, we want to really emphasize because in conventional AM, typically they would teardrop a lot of these channels. And that teardropping effect is really going to pull away from the overall efficiency uh, of heat transfer. You're not going to be able to get that good surface area of contact with your working surface of your tool. Uh, not only that, uh, because of the way we stitch the top of our closures, we do get that 
that smooth uh, finish. And that really does help out in terms of reducing um, the likelihood of premature failure due to uh, cracking uh, of, of um, that may be uh, that may that may, that may be sourced from the roughness um, uh, associated with those downskins. So, in terms of fatigue life um, of these printed tools, um, the smooth quality that we get is going to really improve the overall robustness of the tool itself. Yeah, an interesting story. When we we first started entertaining the idea of of working with tool steel. Um, a customer gave us some parts to look at and it, it was, it was probably this block. Uh, we went from two millimeters up to 15 millimeters and we showed the customer, the original print. And he said, that's better than we've done in seven years of working with tool steel. And it, what he meant was the, the holes were circular and the downskin and upskin surfaces were much better. Um, but we went all the way to 15 millimeters. And, and most recently, we, we've gone up to 40 millimeters. And we can go even further. And, and this is all without internal supports, which that's the way you have to do it because you wouldn't be able to get in and remove those supports anyway. And it's, it's very important for customers that are using uh, high-pressure die-casting tooling inserts to be efficient. Um, so they're not going to they're not going to um, um, want to do any post machining to these cooling or post processing to these cooling channels. They want to print the part, do some heat treating, do some finished machining, and get the part up on the uh, on the die. Absolutely, and uh, here's an example of. Uh, one of the parts that we printed uh, with these large cooling channels of roughly 40 millimeters. Um, and, you know, uh, it, you know, one thing that we should mention is um, with our ability to print these complex geometries, we're not only constrained to these larger circular cooling channels as well. We can print slot-like um, channels which also improve the, the surface area and the contact of a working surface. Um, and uh, so it's, we're not only limited to these type of circular profiles, we can also be very aggressive in terms of how we want to design the cooling channels to really maximize the amount of heat or we're able to pull out of the tool itself. Yeah, and we, we really feel we're at the beginning stages of this and it, and the timing is perfect with the EV market expanding and the need for larger tools. Um, so it, it, it is very exciting. Um, these are the materials that we currently have qualified for our machines. Uh, we started with Inconel 718. A lot of, all of our materials are customer driven. And um, our, we, we got our start in the space industry. Um, we work with just about every space company out there today. Um, and uh, I would say 718 is probably our, one of our most popular materials. Our, on our list, our, our most recent qualified materials on 300 tool steel. And right before that, we've got uh, GRCOP 42. We've got a whole list of materials coming soon. And um, uh, we're, we're working on upwards to 10, uh, of 10 materials at any one time. We're very good at uh, qualifying new materials. Um, we, we typically see a delivery, and, and this is the reason we design and build these, these machines, one of the reasons we design and build the equipment in the US is our deliveries are um, about 10 weeks for the Sapphire, about 20 to 22 weeks on the Sapphire XC. Mm -hmm. And so by the time you get your machine, we can have your new material, if needed, qualified. And we don't, we don't charge for that. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's really a different approach. 
than maybe some of you that have experience with metal AM are used to. Absolutely. Um, and I think that pretty much summarizes what we've got today uh, for our presentation. Um, I can thank you all for your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Paul. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, so we'll go ahead and dive into those and uh, we'll leave it open for now. So if you if you think of anything as we're going through answers, please type it in. Um, so we'll start with this one. Uh, when printing with the M300 tool steel, have your custom recipes eliminated the need for HIT post-processing? And is there any material property ben benefit demonstrated with HIP? Yeah, so... Um, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Paul, sorry. I was just gonna say there, we don't see, for, for high pressure die cast tooling, uh, we don't see a need for HIPping. And what's, what's unusual, a lot of customers will, typically when you, when you print a part in Metal AM, you'll pull it off the machine and stress relieve it before you cut it off the plate. What, it, what we see with a lot of uh, die casters is they cut it off the plate before they do any heat treating or stress relieving. And the reason is, is they need to get the powder out of the channels. But as far as as far as uh, hipping, uh, as I mentioned, you know th th these are real companies making real parts, and they need to make money on the parts, so they're doing it in the most efficient way they can. Yeah, and and you know to Paul's point, uh, another um, another way we we are able to combat the the, the need for post processing is with our recipes. Uh, with the way we are able to build certain features and the kind of uh, way we decide to uh, uh, have our lasers um, produce these geometries, we're able to circumvent uh, common defects and issues such as porosity, uh, which we can see with uh, very difficult to produce geometries. But with our recipes, um, they really do a great job of taking a lot of that away from the part. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, so kind of sticking with the, the materials for a moment. Um, this question is, how do you compare with rot tool steels? And they're specifically interested to know if you meet the NADCA and ADCA requirement for tool steel, if there is a standard that's been developed. Well, I would say we're we're in between a casting and a wrought uh, steel, leaning towards the the wrought. Um, we are we are building uh, at fifty micron layers. We're we're lazing every fifty micron layers, um, so we have very little porosity. We're at about ninety nine point nine percent dense with the part coming right off the machine. As far as the NADCA, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Do, would you know the answer to that question, Sid? I, I unfortunately do not. That's something we can, we can check in and get back to. All right. Uh, the second part of their question, uh, do you have a sense of what the fatigue life comparison would be for, um, for your materials versus rot tools? I don't, I don't think we do. Um, we um, are, are, we don't design the parts mm -hmm. and um, we, we, we print the unusual geometries. And what, what I can say is that the closer your cooling channel follows to the contour of the insert, the better cooling you're going to get, and if if you have a smooth downskin surface, you'll you'll um, uh, create a longer life with the insert. So I I, I I don't have a direct comparison because it's not a direct comparison uh, w when you're when you're doing uh, conformal cooling to conventional metal I mean, to conventional machining. 
All right. All right. Um, did you have something to add, Sid? No, I, I do see another question uh, from, it says, did you say 15 micron layers or 50 micron? We, we use 50 micron layers. Got it. Um, so I wonder if you can sort of expand on the qualification process for, for a new material. What does that look like? Um, what are sort of the, the steps involved? You want to take that, Sid? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll let you take that one, Paul. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the our first material we started with was seven eighteen, and we we developed that material to be able to do these low angle overhangs without support. So any new material we add on, we we it has to conform to those original rules. Um, and then there there is an, a pretty extensive qualification process. I mean, we'll do hundreds of builds to ensure that we can do everything um, that we say we can do. So it, 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 it's a relatively fast process. Um, qualifying a new material could take three months. If it's a sister material, it could take, it could take weeks. Um, but it, it is a pretty extensive process. We just do a very good job of uh, uh, qualifying the materials. Yep, and this qualification process does involve us taking a look at all our recipes and how they need to be modified uh, for the material that we're going to be producing, just to ensure that we're hitting the specifications we're looking for. So it, it is quite thorough and extensive. Yeah, what we found initially with M300, it was very close to Inconel 718. Um, so, but we still had to go through the entire process to qualify that material. All right. Uh, next question here. Um, do the mechanical properties across the parts vary due to the stitch line? Um, well, I, 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 mechanical properties. Um, I would say, um, I think it depends. Um, the stitch line is really where you're, your your closeout is on your cooling channel um and um oh i maybe i i'm thinking of something else uh do you want to take this this one said yeah so uh where the stitch occurs we are using uh different recipes apart from how we typically lays in bulk um so there will be a slight change in uh, maybe how the properties might be at the surface, but they will still, still completely be within spec. Yeah, right. we, are, we are using two one kilowatt lasers on the sapphires, as well as uh, eight one kilowatt lasers on the sapphire XCs. All right, we've got time for um, maybe a couple more here. Um, so talk about how you ensure the confidence and the reliability of the parts. Like what are, what types of recalibrations might be needed? And is that, is that a lengthy recalibration process? Sid, so do you want to take that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there is a calibration process for each machine. Um, so once the calibration has been dialed in, the parts that you produce within one machine will be uh, uh, identical to parts that you get from another machine. It's analogous to the golden print file concept that was that Paul was talking about before. And that calibration process, uh, I would not say it's it's lengthy by any means. It's it can be completed within a, a few short builds. And that it, it typically takes about an hour to two hours to complete that calibration process. So it's 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 very quick. It's it's reasonable uh, to do before maybe a long build. Um, right. But we, as I mentioned, we use uh, a cadence of seven days in our in our lab. So mm -hmm. um, that that's the way our software is set up. So 
if you do not calibrate your machine within that seven day period, you will get a message that uh, the um, one of the five areas needs to be calibrated or all of them. So that that um, that gives us confidence in what we're doing. It also, as I mentioned, we've got the in situ um, beam alignment that we do every single layer. Um, and we're we're monitoring 900 plus sensors on the machine. All right, uh, another audience question here. Um, in your process, do you have several setup parameters in one part, depending on the area of the of the part? So a wall or or an overhang. Um, so I think what they're asking is, can you can you vary the parameters based on the area of the part or the feature? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, you could vary the parameters if you like. However, the recipes that are kind of inbuilt to flow, uh, which you'll be using uh, to design the or set up the build itself, uh, should give you the the best properties intrinsically. Um, so the recipes that we've already kind of pre-developed uh, for these type of features, whether they're walls, on uh, overhangs, thin features, uh, will allow you to produce the parts uh, as dimensionally accurate as possible without with the minimal impact in, in properties. All right, um, as we're nearing the end here, maybe just kind of a, a sort of big picture question since we've been talking about tooling so much. Um, how do you see 3D printed tooling evolving within the, or 3D printing evolving within the tooling market, especially over the next few years? Well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, with the, the growing EV market, it, it uh, you know, you're seeing Tesla's using the Gigapress. So there's these huge, huge die cast um, um, tools that, that need large inserts. And um, so we're, we're seeing that, um, uh, we're seeing that from a lot of customers, a lot of customer requests for the larger tools that can't be done with conventional. Um, not so much in the, the Z height, but in the big 600 millimeter build plate. Um, I also see it with injection molding inserts. Now, conformal cooling has been done with additive manufacturing for a good 15 years. It's not something new. Um, what we've seen is that it's used extensively in Europe, but not as much in the U S and we're working with companies today that really want to automate that process to make it more affordable to go with this conformal cooling channel route. There's a lot more injection molders and tool builders for injection molding out there than there are high pressure die cast. Uh, tooling suppliers and, OE, and OEMs that need them. Um, so I think I think we'll, we'll we, we've already made an impact in high pressure diecast tooling, and I think the next step, the next logical step, is with injection molding in in North America. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, to Paul's point, um, we can also even see potential expansion. Uh, into hot stamping, right? With the larger build volumes that we can now achieve with Metal AM that uh, weren't really done before. Uh, we're actually in the realm of possibility of being able to produce tooling inserts uh, for these much larger applications. Um, and hot stamping is used extensively with an automotive. So um, access to that, that technology and getting uh, and introducing AM to, uh, to the tooling system or ecosystem there, uh, I think is gonna be quite exciting for me at least. Yeah. And ultimately, what, you know, you're not gonna 3D print a part just to 3D print a part. It has to make economical sense. And that that's what we, we've really addressed with the Sapphire XE, addressing that throughput with eight one kilowatt lasers and the ability to to build these large circular cooling channels. Um, so, you know, the, the common saying out there is uh, um, just because you can 3D print it doesn't mean you should. 
and that that you know when you're again dealing with real companies that need to make money and all companies do um you uh you've got to come up with a justification to go to 3d printing and um we we really uh we've found a method to improve upon what has has existed over the past five to ten years and we're we're really excited about it Excellent. All right. Thank you, Paul and Sid. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with your team, uh, what, what would be the best way to get in contact? You ah, can, our, our, yeah, our emails are there and I uh, would be happy, happy to answer any questions um, as well. And, and you can also go to our website at velo3d.com. All right. Um, so we'll leave it there for today. I want to thank fellow 3D for making this webinar possible. And thank you to everybody listening in. Uh, again, you should receive a link to that recording within the next few hours or, or at least within the next 24. And thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you, Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Stephanie.